Hello everyone, and welcome to my video lecture focusing on the poetry of Gwendolyn Brooks, relating her work back to the Chicago Renaissance and the Black Arts Movement. So a little bit of background on Gwendolyn Brooks. She was the daughter of Keziah Corinne, and her father was named David Anderson Brooks. They moved to the south side of Chicago when she was a child, and she grew up primarily on the south side. Early on in her life, Brooks demonstrated a pronounced ability to write poetry and was deeply invested in cultivating her writing style and craft, and her mother supported this. So early on in her life, when she was still a teenager, her mother took her to meet Langston Hughes. Hughes read some of her work and encouraged her to continue her writing. Ultimately, Gwendolyn Brooks ended up writing several books of poetry and novels over the course of her life and was the first black woman to win a Pulitzer Prize for poetry in 1950 for her book of poems, Annie Allen. So how can we think about Gwendolyn Brooks's work in the larger context of the time period and literary movements? So last time we were talking a great deal about passing um, by Nella Larson and the writing of the Harlem Renaissance, which is probably one of the most best known black literary movements. However, there was also another Renaissance in Chicago that took place after the Harlem Renaissance primarily from the 1930s through the 1950s. This was Chicago's literary response to black migration to an urban city. It was less nostalgic about the rural past, more about transcending the, the sufferings of the past, getting away from the South. So less of a focus on the folk and more focus on urban living. This often involved commentary on political movements and a focus on labor and Marxism. Moreover, as Don Turner Trice writes, unlike the Harlem Renaissance, from about 1919 to the mid-1930s, the Chicago movement didn't have as its face such well-known intellectuals such as W.E.B. Du Bois. Chicago artists didn't have relatively large numbers of wealthy white patrons who helped support their art. In addition, Chicago, unlike New York, wasn't the publishing mecca of the country, so artists and their work weren't readily introduced to a national audience. Nevertheless, Gwendolyn Brooks did have a pronounced audience of readers um, and became one of the most well-known poets of her time period. Other key figures of the Chicago Renaissance include Richard Wright. He is probably the foremost figure with his work, Native Son. But in addition to him, there is also figures like Brooks and then, of course, Lorraine Hansberry, whose play, A Raisin in the Sun, similar to Brooks's work, focuses on housing issues in Chicago and how they impact black life. Gwendolyn Brooks's poetry was recognized from the beginning for its masterful form and lyrical voice. She was able to tap into the everyday, or what we would call the quotidian, in order to speak to the specific experience of black people, but also their universal humanity. A primary example of this occurs in one of our assigned readings, the bean eaters. They eat beans mostly, this old yellow pear. Dinner is a casual affair. Plain chipware on a plain creaking wood. Tin flatware. Two are mostly good. Two have, have lived their day, but keep on putting their clothes and putting things away. And remembering, remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and clothes, tobacco crumbs, faces and fringes. Within this poem, we recognize an aspect of life that we may not readily attend to or observe, the aspect of aging. And aging involves collecting things, collecting material items like clothes, dolls, receipts, tobacco crumbs, faces, all the little material items that are associated with the past that may not 
have an immediate material value, but have another kind of value, um, one connected to memory. And so in this way, by picking up on all these little items and including the language of remembering, we have a moment that is both specific to this old pair, but also perhaps universal, a sign of how aging and living together after a full life um, can come with a kind of melancholy, but also a very sort of everyday sense of remembrance. And so at this point, I encourage you to find another pair of lines. I focused on remembering and the last two lines, but other lines that give us a glimpse of black life that can also connect to a bigger or universal idea. The Chicago Renaissance and the greater context for Gwendolyn Brooks's work is also informed by the second wave of the Great Migration and the Black Belt. So what is the second wave of the Great Migration? Although less known than the Great Migration of 1910 through 1930, when large numbers of African Americans first moved to Chicago from the South, the period of 1940 through 1960 actually saw more African Americans arrive in the city owing to such factors as the availability of industrial jobs during World War II and the collapse of Southern sharecropping system. The housing market in Chicago was tight, even before the end of World War II, when veterans returned in need of housing. African Americans were primarily limited to an area of Chicago known as the Black Belt which was located between 12th and 79th Streets and Wentworth and Cottage Grove Avenues. Approximately 60,000 Blacks had moved to the South to Chicago during 1940 to 1944 in search of jobs. In an effort to keep the newly arriving African Americans out of their neighborhoods, whites within residential blocks formed restrictive covenants, legally binding contracts that specified an owner's, excuse me, a house's owner could not rent or sell to black people. So again, this is a covenant that says if you own the house, even if it is your property, you cannot rent or sell to black people. Such covenants by restricting African Americans to the black belt increased overcrowding within this, this area during the war. And then here to the right, we have a map of the Black Belt, the darkest areas being the highest population of African Americans and the lighter parts being places where there were not African Americans. Bearing this information in mind, we can better appreciate the Ballad of Rudolph Reed, one of our selections. We can better appreciate the Ballad of Rudolph Reed, one of our assigned poems, by bearing this information about the black belt and overcrowding in mind. So this is not the beginning of the poem, but a couple of selections. And then a little bit further down from the top of it, it reads, a neighbor would look with a yawning eye that squeezed into a slit. But the Rudolph Reeds and the children three were too joyous to notice it. For were they not firm in a home of their own with windows everywhere? and a beautiful banister stair, and a front yard for flowers, and a backyard for grass. The first night, a rock, big as two fists, the second, a rock as big as three. But nary a curse, cursed Rudolph Reed, though oaken as man could be. The third night, a silvery ring of glass, patience ached to endure. But he looked in low, small Mabel's blood, was stazing her gaze so pure. Then up did rise our Rudolph Reed and pressed the hand of his wife and went to the door with a thirty-four and a beastly butcher knife. He ran like a mad thing into the night and the words in his mouth were stinking. By time he had hurt his first white man, he was no longer thinking. So as my reading of the poem suggests, or hopefully indicates, again, Brooks is excellent at using both meter and rhyme, and in this case, creating a kind of whimsical sound and tone for a particularly challenging moment of racial strife that ends in violence. The first half of the poem is a story of a family man who wants to provide those he cares for with a better life by moving them out of the city. 
So they move out of the city, they integrate a neighborhood, and in the process, they do not notice how their neighbors are looking at them because they're so happy with their new home. They're even able to accept the first acts of violence, rocks being thrown in through the window. But Rudolph Reed can no longer handle the violence when he sees one night that a rock has hit Mabel and she's bleeding. And again, we might think about here, this sense of the whimsy or the whimsical tone, almost of a nursery rhyme that we get, the intense violence and how it is sparked by the violated innocence of his young child, Mabel. During this time period, there were many white race mobs that helped keep black families out of their neighborhoods, but they weren't always reported on. Integration of neighborhoods was an extremely charged affair. Riots by white mobs were not uncommon. Most Chicagoans, however, had no idea of the situation's volatility. For much of the 1940s, the major newspapers, at the request of the Chicago Commission on Human Relations, so in this case, at the request of the government, newspapers did not report on these riots. Nevertheless, they were consistent throughout the 20th century. So for example, up at the top of the page, we have white children outside the black family's house. They had set on fire during the Chicago race riot of 1919. Then below, we have another image of a burning piano outside of a house after residents learned an African-American family planned on moving in. And this second image takes place in 1951, closer to Brooks's time period. But both indicate the long history of housing discrimination and the response of white neighbors. And therefore, her poetry is capturing a history that, as we note with this information here about the newspapers, many did not actually um, become aware of because it was suppressed news. So what does this poem do that the newspapers do not? What does it express? that the newspapers cannot and do not express. This is one of your questions you might consider. For the majority of black families forced to stay in the city, housing became a crisis. Many were overcrowded into singular apartments, multiple families, and these were called kitchenette apartments. These apartments rarely had bathrooms and all occupants of a floor had to share a single bathroom. And so here to the right, we have an image um, from the Chicago archives, Negro family living in crowded quarters, just to further illustrate how intense the housing crisis would be and how Brooks is commenting on this reality of black life. So we get the full sense of that visual and that history in her poem, Kitchenette Building, where people are thinking about things like dreams, rent, feeding a wife, and satisfying a man. Something we might consider? Why does Brooks put rent, feeding a wife, and satisfying a man in quotation marks? What effect does that have? What voice does it bring in? Moving further along in Brooks's work, and a shift in her political sensibilities towards the 1960s with the rise of the Black Power Movement and the Black Arts Movement, she began to change how she approached her poetry. As she wrote, until 1967, my own blackness did not confront me with a shrill spelling of itself. Yet almost secretly, I'd always felt that black was good. And this comes from her autobiographical journals. And so I'm going to pause here and switch to another video where I will continue to talk about Black Pride, Black Power, and the Black Arts Movement and how it relates back to a shift in Brooks's writing that we may be able to track as we look at her later poetry, including works such as We Real Cool and Black Boy Breaking Glass.